Good evening, everyone. Let's begin the way we normally do and just find ourselves into a sitting posture. Allowing the lungs to fill and empty a few times. Just feeling that. And even allowing the heart to appreciate this breath that gives us life. We can simply be grateful that we're alive. And on one level, aliveness makes sense. We can feel the breath, for example. And we can know what this means, that this body is an alive mechanism. And in another way we can appreciate that life is such a mystery. We're not even, there's no need even to figure that out. But just allowing ourselves to be humbled by the mystery of it all. And dropping any arrogant views that we have it figured out that we know what living is all about and we know how to do it. And from this humble grounded place We can just get curious about what it's like to be alive. No notions of knowing already. Just a sweet 
newness to the exploration. And perhaps feeling into the body as one way to know what it's like to be alive. Aware of the body. Aware of sensations. Warmth and coolness. Firmness. Movement. The actual experience of the body is beyond concept. Let's see if we can know it. This is what it's like to be alive. This body is alive. Sensations are always changing. Never stagnant. Noticing that difference between knowing the body and thinking about the body. No need to be concerned about the mind that thinks. This is a normal function of the body. And the ears do their job and the nose does its job.
The eyes do their job. Just getting to know the difference between the experience of the body and thinking about the body. And in doing so, we get to know what it's like to be aware of thought. What's it like to be mindful of thinking? Instead of just allowing ourselves to think and think and think, just getting interested in this activity of mind that produces these little blips of energy. They're so seductive, pull us in. And birth the self right there in the midst of thinking. Just for now, just noticing this capacity of the mind to think, its tendency to get swept away by thought. And then this humbling, grounding return to the bare essence of the body feeling the body and returning to knowing what it's like to be alive. No need to make this overly sophisticated. Just staying intimate in a very basic way and seeing what we can learn here. And we'll continue in silence now.
And opening your eyes whenever you're ready. Coming back into the room with everyone else. Thanks for your practice, everyone. And go ahead and take a minute to stretch your body. It's okay to stand up if you'd like to do that. Curious if anybody's here for the first time. If you are, if you'd like to unmute yourself and say hello, that'd be great. Well, as you know, I've been working through a book for quite a while now, about a year, I think, almost a year. And so Listening to the Heart is the name of the book by Tanisara and Kitty Saro. And we're in this, we're in chapter 10. Chapter 11, actually. This chapter is called Radical Reflection. And it begins with this quote from the Heart Sutra. When Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, and this is um, the equivalent of Kuan Yin, was practicing the profound Prajna Paramita, she illuminated the five khandas and saw that they all that they are all empty, and she crossed beyond all suffering and difficulty. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the five khandas tonight. Thanks, Jessica. And before I get too much into the to the five aggregates, the Pali word is kanda or skanda, which means like big old giant heap of stuff. It probably is um, a little more, there's more depth to it than that. Uh, but that is a common translation of kanda, like a heap. And so these kandas are a way of describing this experience that we're having as humans. And also the way that we sort of misperceive what's going on here and how that misperception leads to all kinds of problems for us. And so learning this important and sophisticated, one of the most sophisticated maps of uh, the Buddha's teachings can be really um, empowering and useful to us. And we could spend um, much time on this map, but for tonight, I'd like to just give a bit of an overview and place it in the context of the times that we're living in. because this is what the Buddha did when he taught. You know, reading through the, the scriptures and going directly back to some of the source documents and teachings from the time of the Buddha. It was really clear that, you know, some of the, many of the examples he gave, a lot of the nature examples are, were relevant to the way people were living then. And even more than that, the Buddha was speaking directly to the cultural, um, the culture of the times and in particular, the caste system. So it's important that as we are receiving and making sense of the teachings that we're always kind of 
contextualizing them for how we're, we're living now. And so as I've been immersed in this beautiful chapter, you know, Kitty Saro did this right from the beginning. And so I'd like to read, it's kind of a long description, but it, it really struck me as being so relevant to now. Let me page again. And also they're just beautiful storytellers. And so it's nice to, as we go along in the book, at least in some, on some weeks, read a little bit from their beautiful illustrations of practice. And just to give you fair warning, there is um, you know, some indication of violence in this uh, description and the death of a person. So in case that is hard for you to hear, you can uh, make a choice for yourself that feels most important to you and in including, it's just gonna be like two or three minutes, but you can step away from your screen if you'd like to do that. When Tanisara and I first arrived in South Africa in 1994, the atmosphere was laced with the threat of violence, fear and suspicion. It was a society that was still very segregated in spite of the tremendous victory over apartheid. During our first teaching engagement in Johannesburg, a member of a small meditation group showed us around. At one point, she opened her bag and showed us her gun as nonchalantly as if she were pointing out her lipstick. Certainly we weren't in the monastery anymore. Over the next few years, we heard numerous stories of hijackings, murder, and rape. We visited affluent white people who lived within barred windows, high electrified walls, and alarmed houses. While in contrast, we saw that the rural black African communities were extremely impoverished, under-resourced, and marginalized. Basically, we had arrived into a deeply traumatized situation the shock of which was strangely muted by the accepted normalcy of it all. Over our initial years of teaching Dharma, it became clear that in spite of the truly heroic act of overcoming apartheid, the psychological wounds would be much harder to overcome. Early on at Dharmagiri, not long after the land was acquired in January, 1995, a Zulu family, a mother called Angel and her three sons, who were refugees of political violence, took up residence in the empty gatehouse. They stayed for eight years. We supported each of the children through schooling and various trainings. However, each was overwhelmed by the challenges of a deeply unequal society. Staying in school and finding jobs in an area that had 80% unemployment was a never ending impossibility. The youngest son who liked to use his English name, Sydney had patiently met one challenge after another until he managed to secure a coveted position in the police force. It was his dream come true. Sidney threw himself into his training. He was strong, principled, and full of ideals of youth. On his home visits, by then he considered us white parental figures. He talked of being trained in the use of guns and of harrowing car chases on the tail of hijacked cars. The last time we spoke to Sydney, he was full of self-respect and hope. We had helped him build his own small house and he was ready to fully enter the responsibilities of manhood. However, it was not to be. At the age of 24, he was shot in the head while in the line of duty, chasing a gang of robbers in a local township. The loss of Sydney hit us hard. Unfortunately, his murder was only part of the daily toll of early death, AIDS, racism, denial, and fractured relationships that we encountered in South Africa. It has never been an easy environment within which to plant the seeds of the Dharma. We met one challenging crisis after another. Eventually, however, when the abusive and highly racially divisive behavior of someone we trusted embroiled us in a highly conflicted situation, we suddenly found ourselves isolated. It was time to take a breather. A friend who was a close disciple of Master Hua advised, 
when it was too dangerous for the, re for the ancients to practice in a new place, they went through and went into long retreat. And so I don't know about you, but I just really appreciate hearing the real life difficulties in a place like South Africa. And hopefully we can see the similarities and the undercurrent of the most challenging political, social upheaval and the oppression of people of color. And I just, I was reminded that, you know, in these really important moments, we can kind of find ourselves in these very difficult places in our own hearts and our families and our lives. And it can be easy to feel like, wow, this is unbearable. This complexity is unbearable. The challenges seem unbearable. And yet to remember that this is really the place where practice begins, right in the middle of all the complexity with the conditions as they are with uh, tragic loss and extreme circumstances that somehow there is this connection or this capacity to find freedom, to look for freedom, to search for freedom, for this heart to feel the possibility of peace. Even if it means that in moments, we do what we need to do to take care of ourselves. After, I'm not at all sure what happened. Zoom just decided to quit, but I'm glad it didn't happen for you. So let's see. I think I was just trying to make the point that in the middle of life, you know, we make all kinds of choices about how we practice and what feels like the most important tools that we can pull out to support us, to support healing, to support our own well being. And even if it means for periods of time, taking refuge in silence or solitude. I was mentioning that Kitty Sara went into retreat for a year and Tanisara decided to immerse herself in a, in a, a psychology training program for a year. And their needs were different at that time, right? Kitty Sara really needed silence and seclusion and Tanisara needed to be um, bathed in wholesome relationships. And these are, you know, examples of choices that we make all the time. And whatever important choices we're making about how we're taking care of ourselves, how we're practicing, it can be really important to continue to keep in mind the deepest freedom. Right? We've been talking about this for weeks, how to keep the deepest freedom in mind, how to keep Nibbana in mind how to keep non-clinging in mind. And so the khandas are a, are a beautiful teaching to help us learn how to relate skillfully in our lives to what it means to be alive, a way of describing what this, this question like, what is this, this human existence? Because we can't really know how to be free unless we start to feel into what it's like to be alive. So this week I've also been um, listening to the Black and Buddhist Summit. Has anybody else been doing that? Yeah, Patrice. 
Gabe. Yeah. Well, there's still another day left, and um, if you and you can, you can listen in. It's uh, offered freely, and you can access the recordings from 48 hours before today. So, and it's also quite accessible for many people um, to pay a fee and have access to more of the recordings from previous. And so kind of right in line with this theme, um, this beautiful summit of Black and Buddhist teachers have been offering their deep Dharma. And I'm so appreciating the variety of perspectives communicated on the summit, many different sessions on, oh, I wouldn't even be able to begin to describe them all, but really, uh, really a beautiful expression of what it means to live and practice and creatively address our own well being in ways that feel really relevant to the context of our times. So this kind of at the root of all this is this question about how we how we live in the middle of all of this, how we wake up in the middle of all of this. And we can find some really important self, like psychological strategies in the Buddhist teachings and attitude um, and practices that help us really clarify and purify our attitude of mind that we bring into all of our activities of daily life. And yet it feels equally as important to really understand the depth of the teachings. Like, where is it? What is the possibility here? Is it just a slight decrease in anxiety or uh, learning how to do less harm in my relationships, which if that's all we did with practice would still be a beautiful contribution to our life. But in addition to some like psychological support that we might get from meditation practice or mindfulness practice, there is this deep possibility of complete freedom. And that doesn't mean extracting ourselves from the complexity of life, right? It doesn't mean doing that. It means like right here in the middle, in the context of our shared humanity, in the context of all of our broken social systems, then we actually learn how to feel into those questions. Like what, how is it that we can be free in the middle of this messy mind? in the middle of this anxiety that doesn't seem to want to lift, in the middle of all this injustice. What is the Dharma? What does the Dharma tell us about how to do that? And if I had one straightforward answer, I'd just say it, <laughs> but I don't. But the beauty of it is that it requires our creativity. It requires us to learn how to trust ourselves. We have to know ourselves so that we can trust what's needed right now, right? And that will be different for each of us. Do you guys know that song? It's an old Simon Garfunkel song, Bridge Over Troubled Water. Yeah, this is such a beautiful song. I might play it for you at the end of tonight. But it feels like I've been listening to that song on repeat <laughs> this week <laughs> because it feels like such deep dharma, like practice is our bridge over troubled water. It is like that, you know, our capacity to really be with suffering, to feel it, to learn how to 
not reject suffering or complexities feels like a real gift of practice. And perhaps that, you know, this interesting uh, thing about, you know, being a bridge over troubled water, practice being a bridge over troubled water kind of leads me to another question, like, well, what does it mean to be a bridge for each other? And, and here is where, you know, I, I necessarily go to the deepest teachings because it's actually in the, um, the clinging mind that needs to rely on tools of separation in order to be happy or safe. But at, in the depth of the heart that is free, there is, in the depth of the heart that is free, there is a, a deeper capacity to care about life and it's all of its mystery. So it's like an interesting thing that the Dharma is so deep and the capacity for freedom is so real that we don't need to... Um, sort of like take ourselves out of our lives in order to experience that. And that it's right in the middle of this entanglement of the heart or this entangled difficult relationship that we start to feel into what it's like, like what true freedom is like. So one of the, um, one of the black and Buddhist um, episodes this week, uh, there was a, a person, a, a practitioner, Jarvis J. Masters, and he, I promptly ordered his book after I heard um, the presentation. And here it is, Finding Freedom. I was so moved by the simplicity of his teachings. He is a person who is in San Quentin on death row and has been a Buddhist practitioner for a long time. The foreword was written by Pema Chodron and he has some really deep teachers. So I'd like to read just a very short snippet of this book. Again, as another illustration of what Kitty Saro and Tanisara were doing there in South Africa with all of their um, humanitarian efforts and what uh, Bhante Buddharakita, who is a monk in Uganda and is helping his people get clean water. And what Ayo Yatunde with Black and Buddhist Summit is doing by um, being a bridge over troubled water for her people, right? It's the same thing that uh, Jarvis J. Masters is doing here in his teaching for his community at San Quentin. which is looking for the deepest place of freedom right in the middle of life. When I'm asked about the title of my book, Finding Freedom, and how I'm able to obtain such a freedom behind the walls of San Quentin, we're still on death row, and for all the years I've been here, my mind soars above the question and wonders, does anybody want to know how badly I want out of prison? Can a practicing Buddhist ever cry foul at the injustice of being here? Or is the purpose of my being here in prison, no matter rightly or wrongly, justly or unjustly, precisely what lies at the heart of the Buddhist teachings? Freedom can be found in any situation I may be confronted with. True freedom is not about where I am, but rather about the practice of cultivating peace within my heart and mind. I mean, if Jarvis can do it in San Quentin, we certainly have a fighting chance of doing it here with the privileges of not being behind bars.
So the Buddha's teaching on the Four Noble Truths, right in the, this is a statement from the Buddha, you know, right in the beginning and uh, this is description of the Four Noble Truths, he points right to the five aggregates of clinging. He says, now this is the noble truth of dukkha. Right? Dukkha is suffering or unsatisfactoriness of life. Dukkha is this, um, this um, feeling that something's not right here. Pain. You know. Now this is the noble truth of dukkha. Birth is dukkha. Aging is dukkha. Death is dukkha. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha. Association with the unbeloved is dukkha. Separation from, from the loved is dukkha. Not getting what is wanted is dukkha. In short, the five clinging aggregates are, du are dukkha. Or sometimes that's translated to be the five focuses of the grasping mind. So, so, you know, life is just expressed right there. Birth is dukkha, death is dukkha, sorrow, lamentation, pain, you know, all of these things just goes, goes through it. Grief and despair, association with unbeloved is dukkha, separation from those who we love is suffering, not getting what we want is suffering. In short, all the five aggregates of clinging so these five ways that this mind um, constructs a sense of self around experience. This is what the five aggregates of these five heaps. And so these just briefly are form. So like the body, feeling, or this effectual overlay on top of experience, like every experience has a kind of effectual overlay. So whether or not something is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. So form and feeling, and then perception, mental formations, anything we think, and consciousness, which is maybe the most difficult to describe or understand. So form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. These are the five aggregates of clinging or the five ways that the Buddha kind of describes this experience of um, living, right? And interestingly, form, body is just one of them and the other four are related to the mind, right? So form, this body, what it sees, what it hears, what it tastes, what it feels. This are examples of form. All the internal and external forms. So not only just, you know, the, the hearing function of the ears, but the projections, the, the, the sound of the bird, for example. And here we start to understand that, that the way that we, our current misunderstanding doesn't really match reality, which is why we suffer. So we study and practice understanding the aggregates with a lot of reference for our human condition because it's not easy, right? It's not gonna be easy for this human being to sort of understand what the Buddha is talking about here. And there's nothing wrong with having an inner confidence about who we are, but we have to be aware that this identity that every moment that is misunderstood, every moment where we, we misinterpret this, these processes that m keep this body alive, when we misunderstand stand that and call that a Shelley or you know, identi over identify with that, forget that this is just a body that has emerged 
due to conditions that have given rise to it, then, you know, it's painful, right? And each, and often these moments of, um, of a self being constructed happen right here in the mind with our thoughts. So the irony is that pulling apart existence into its like component parts, right? Form, feeling, perception, mental formations, consciousness can actually be quite unifying because on one hand, we use these identities to have a sense of belonging and find some safety in overwhelmingly unsafe and uncertain world, but it's not the whole end of the story. So we're both embracing this, the ways in which this human experience makes sense of the world and moves towards a sense of belonging and safety, like, oh yeah, uh, I'm Shelly, I'm a social worker, I'm a teacher, right? Some of this kind of makes me feel like I know who I am. And yet we also can keep in mind that these are constructions of the mind. These are um, thoughts, just simply thoughts. And although they are supportive in one way, understanding their emptiness is also really important. Understanding that this body, for example, is not who I am. It is a body that has a force and a life of its own, which is somewhat hard to grasp for this, uh, for this human mind, right? But what is, if the body is me, then is the knee Shelly or the elbow Shelly or the liver Shelly? Like where is a Shelly in this body, this form that's here? And, you know, this mind that will kind of fixate on a sense of self also forgets that form, for example, or any of these aggregates are always in a, a state of continuous change. So taking the body, for example, like m this idea that Shelley is here in this body, you know, just as soon as I said that, then it, there's a new moment. And with every breath, you know, there's so much happening inside this body that is it, is it really the same? You know, is that, can I say that is true now? And we kind of don't see that this, you know, life is in this constant state of flux, which is why it's important to, with our practice, tune into beginnings and endings and transitions because we can start to learn that, even though it's difficult for this human, human being to kind of grok that, it is still possible. My nephew, my nephew has a new girlfriend and he was telling his mom reluctantly about it and she was trying not to ask too many questions. But my sister asked him something like, well, do you think she's attractive or what makes her attractive? And he was sort of quiet and mortified by the question and basically said, I'm not attracted to her body. <laughs> Which was, you know, adorable for a young person to have this kind of wisdom, right? Like what I'm interested in is a connection. He said something to that extent, like this connecting experience that we have in these ways is what I find myself drawn to. And so, you know, in, in all kinds of really ordinary ways, we can start to feel into the um, fragility of these constructions that we have around who I am. Like I am this body or um, these superficial kind of ways in which we move through the world. 
and yet and and be able to look for something deeper like true connection what does it mean to be truly connected what does it mean to be truly connected here and what does it mean to be connected in this interdependent way with other beings and so it's here that even in this ordinary moments of like attraction and growing up, do we find some seed of the deepest freedom? So I'm going to quickly go through the a little bit I talked about body, um, and I'll quickly go through the other four, um, just to give us all a sense of what they're pointing to. So the five aggregates form. Uh, the second one is feeling. So this kind of every experience has comes with this. We often don't notice it. But there's this very basic way that we uh, that it shapes that it that it shapes clinging, right? This noticing, and when we can learn to tune in in this way, we can start to uh, see how vacant it actually is of substance. So all of the time we are uh, navigating and negotiating in this realm. So with pleasant experience, with unpleasant experience, and with experience that's neither pleasant or unpleasant, what we might call neutral. So, and this is kind of a, at the heart of what we can see in practice, that that which is pleasant, we want more of, that which is unpleasant, we try to get away from, and often that which is neutral, we ignore. And so as we start to tune in in this way to feeling, to pleasant, we can notice like, oh, you know, what is this? What is happening here? Why is it that I keep doing this behavior? Last, last night, my, uh, well, actually two nights ago, my, both of my pets had a rough night. They were sick. And um, I don't know if it was coincidence. They're both feeling better today, it seems but it was a, a pretty sleepless night for me attending to them because they were up and doing what sick pets do, throwing up and stuff like this. And um, I was just <laughs> used it as an opportunity to practice. I mean, you know, I'm human. And so I wasn't happy about being up almost every hour throughout the night. Um, and once I tuned into like this mind that was you know, that it didn't help to actually be cranky about it. So that's the first reality. And then the second was an inquiry about what is actually going on here. And what I noticed pretty quickly is that, oh, so picking, cleaning up vomit was not actually a problem. What was the pro the problem was all of the looping thoughts that I was being seduced by about how awful this is and how terrible and what a, you know, how poor me that I have to be up at two in the morning doing this, right? And whatever else was going there. But it was this, it was this, you know, noticing like, okay, this is like, the smell is not great. It's kind of unpleasant, but it's not, you know, terrible, <laughs> just slightly unpleasant. And then there's this interest or this, instinct to want to get away from it right and then you know all of these thoughts like uh, right there like I was no longer connected to these four-legged beings that I adore I was like absorbed in a self-centered kind of way with the Shelly who was being oppressed by this problem in the middle of the night right? so we can kind of see that the way when when we forget just like I did, to notice that there's an unpleasant experience here and there's a relationship to that, a not wanting it, a pushing it away, 
that kind of spins, it sets everything off, right? This is one of the aggregates set everything off, clinging to the aggregate set off a whole system of suffering, right? We hardly even notice it. But just tuning into that very basic unpleasantness that was there allowed a lot more space and freedom. I was tired. It didn't smell good, but I had a lot more capacity to care for these beings in this moment. Right? There was actually a lot of space for love and compassion and there once this heart was able to see, have a sense of what was actually going on. So trying to hold on to pleasant experience, trying to push away unpleasant experience and just ignoring what is neutral is one of the ways that this, is that, is that one of the ways that we cling to and experience and construct a sense of self right there, right here in real time. And then the third aggregate perception and this is, you know, kind of the way that we make sense of the world. And we, you know, by perceiving, by making a decision about uh, any experience, any object that arises into our experience. And so it could be like naming something, right? Naming a cup, naming a person, naming a house, naming these kinds of namings, these conceptual namings that happen. Uh, Gil Fronstahl changes the word perception and calls it recognition, recognition of something. But what's important to remember about perception is that we often can forget that perception comes with historical references, right? Is informed by memory. It's informed by familiar familiarity. And so what we perceive in this moment is not just, uh, it's not just informed by something that's like uh, objective. It comes like ancestry comes with it. So for example, if I, I, I know that this is my phone Everybody knows what a smartphone looks like these days, but my grandparents or my, my great great grandparents might not have any idea what a device like this was, right? Whereas I might take a quick glance at it, the mind registers, the word comes forward. This is a quick perception and I have this view that it might be an objective perception, but it's actually not. Right, because it, it is informed by context and time and might not be uh, the same for everyone, certainly isn't the same for everyone. But perception is a relatively automatic process. Like as soon as we open our eyes, we are perceiving. So we have to, with our practice, learn to train our perception so that we are seeing the world in really useful ways, like as something that is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and natural. And these kinds of perceptions are onward leading. They lead us to the deepest source of freedom beyond what is contextualized to the time. And then the fourth aggregate, volitional or mental formations. You can summarize this one as like um, all of the kinds of thought so thinking, emotion, feelings like guilt or sadness, thoughts, ideas, opinions, prejudices, compulsions, decisions that are activated by something. So all these kinds of mental formations that 
come to the fore and that inspires some kind of response. And these kind of volitions, intentions even, can be skillful and unskillful. So we get good at knowing them and naming them, noticing them, so that we can learn how to um, cultivate intentions that are skillful and notice and not uh, react to intentions that are unskillful. And intentions are always guiding us. We just almost so often, we just don't even notice them. So with every action that we take, every time we move our body, there is every time we make a decision, there is an intention that preceded that, that we almost always miss. And these are the kinds of karmic seeds that we're planting all of the time. Right? These habits where habits of mind are created. So when we can learn how to recognize our intentions that arise, we can actually learn how to make choices about our response and that aren't completely dependent on the reactivity of the mind. And then the fifth um, aggregate, this aggregate called consciousness. And uh, one of my teachers said that consciousness is dumb. It's just like, really, but, you know, it's actually so much more than it. It's yes, it's a yes and, right? So I'm not going to go too much into consciousness, but we can think about consciousness as, as this really raw yes, like the mind's online, right? Like, ah, uh, alive, awake, ah, uh, conscious. But if you ask a lot of different people what consciousness is, you're going to get a lot of different answers which so the Buddhist teachings on consciousness are uh, a bit more challenging and complicated than that, but just as a, a quick overview. Okay. So what does this mean? What does this mean? So often in the, you know, back to kind of where we started, it's our responsibility to, um, To, to practice and live in a way that feels most supportive, right? And completely honors the reality of the times that we're living in, the reality of our lives as they are. And, you know, often I can feel like, well, there's just, you know, not an easy way out of this mess called suffering. And, and so this capacity that we have to really explore and to surrender. We hear this word all the time. Teachers say this, like surrender to the truth, surrender to the reality, surrender to the way things are, right? When we can do that, we, in the deepest way possible, we find that there is, we find what Jarvis Masters found in his own practice, that even when things are crazy messy, there is this possibility of freedom. How do we know, how do we find that potential to not cling right in the middle of things? And he goes through, I haven't read the whole book, um, maybe just a third of it, but he, he really goes, gives it to us straight. You know, it's not easy. There's a lot of, it's loud. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of unpleasantness. There's fear. That comes up all the time. But like he said, you know, I'll just read. Or is the purpose of my being here in prison, no matter rightly or wrongly, justly or unjustly, precisely what lies at the heart of the Buddhist teachings? Freedom can be found in any situation I may be confronted with. True freedom is not about where I am, but rather about the practice of cultivating peace within my heart and mind. So these pointers to how we cling, what is the mechanism of suffering? Oh, right here in the moment of perception. 
Oh, right here in taking this body so personally. Oh, right here in forgetting that there is a pleasant or unpleasantness that is propelling this whole thing forward. Right here in these moments where we, we find that the lack of freedom is birthed. And it's when we can start to see this, then we can start to understand more deeply and stay connected to that, what Kitty Saro calls source, this potential, this possibility, this capacity that we all have for waking up. And it's nine o'clock. Thanks for your attention tonight. Patrice, would you do us the honors? So um, let's all join together in this wonderful act of imaginative generosity called sharing the merit. So if there's any blessing, any goodness, any benefit, to our time together tonight, we would happily, joyfully, gladly share it with others. And if we could, in fact, we would give it all away. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our friends, our families, our community, those we like, those we don't like, those we know, those we don't know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we'd offer it to the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the wingeds, the scaly, the slithery, all the beings everywhere. May all beings everywhere find a path of peace and be free from suffering. Thanks, Patrice. Good night, everyone.